Chapter 16, Hard Truths. You stand outside the palace ballroom as Vessel smirks at you, holding up pictures of the real Rose and Devlin. So anything you wish to say for yourself now that you've been caught sneaking out on your Ishmari suitor? Cecil, are you trying to blackmail your princess right now? Because if you are, I think very carefully about the consequences. The funny thing about blackmail, your highness, is that if it's done right, no one but us will ever know it happened. Given the contents of this photo, I think you'll agree that discretion is in both of our best interests. I've endured your shenanigans this season out of deference to your father, but this business between you and the Ishmari Prince must end. That is why you'll be sabotaging Clark's farewell ball. What? You heard me. When the two of you are planning the ball, you'll ensure that it's sufficiently disastrous. That should undo all the fraternizing you've encouraged. But, just in case the Prince still thinks of proposing, you will break things off with him permanently tomorrow night. You can't do this. I'll tell the King. Not unless you want these pictures all over the cover of every major Monterian publication. He holds up the photos again, waving them before you. How did he even get those? As your mind spins, Cecil tucks the photos back in his pocket and fixes you in one last glare. One word of advice. Prince Clark will hurt me whether you do as I say, or whether these photos get plastered across every tabloid in Europe. But if you do as I've asked, at least your family and kingdom will be safe from scandal. The choice is yours. Some choice. It's the only one you've got, your highness, so choose wisely. Across the capital. If we'll Volvea sighed after her big announcement while the other Deltas chatter excitedly amongst themselves. Are you serious you want me to lead the Deltas? I do. And no, I haven't forgotten that you're going back to America when the semester ends. But you're the only reason we've made it this far, Rose. I know you'll do right by them until you go home. Faye, I'm honored by your competence. I'll do my best to make you and the Deltas proud. Something tells me it'll come naturally to you. Just then, your phone buzzes in your pocket. He knows. What on earth? But before you can decipher the bizarre text, there's a loud knock at the door. Pretty late for someone to be knocking. Did Kaylee order another late-night pizza? Hmm, pizza sounds nice. You open the door to find... Devin. What a lovely surprise. I thought you were covering another story tonight. I was. Then what are you... At the palace. There's confusion and hurt written all across his face. And as you think about Daisy's text, your heart suddenly sinks. Oh, no. We need to talk alone. You usher him up to Daisy's room. The moment the door closes behind you, he starts pacing, his shoulders tense. So, after the Greek golf, you went to the palace? Yeah. Had to get covering some charity ball, and the crown princess was there. The one who uh, almost never shows her face in public. If she did, maybe I would have figured out earlier that she looks exactly like you. Devin, I... He turns to face you. Tell me that wasn't you. Tell me that's just some crazy coincidence that you were just some royal lookalike running around. Devin... I'm the royal lookalike. What? I'm Rose Juliavart, Crown Princess of Monterey. The words hang in the air as he stares at you. You're a princess? I'm so sorry, Devin. The real Daisy and I never meant for things to get so complicated. So, she's the one at the palace? Yes. I felt so trapped there, and when Daisy and I met at the start of the semester, it felt like the perfect opportunity. She wanted to taste a royal life. I wanted to experience something, well, um, normal. Uh, to forget my responsibilities and just have fun. 
So that's all this was to you? Just fun, meaningless fling? That's not what I... The whole semester. I thought we were really getting to know each other, but you were lying to me. I didn't want to. Things just got so out of hand. Devin finally stops pacing and looks you dead in the eye. Then tell me the truth for once. Was anything between us even real? Of course it was real. I never meant for it to get so complicated, but the more time we spent together, the more I... How can you expect me to believe that after everything you just told me? Devin, I... I... I have to go. Still gotta submit the article on the Deltas today. The Deltas and Daisy, anyway. Promise me you'll leave the truth about us out of the article. No one can know. He's quiet as he just stares back at you. As if waiting for a reason to even consider it. Please, Devin, for... My sake. I know you understand what it's like to want to break out of the family mold. All I ever wanted was a chance to be myself. And no matter what my name is or where I come from, I care about you. I thought you cared about me too. The tension hangs in the air as you stare pleadingly at him. And Dilly finally shakes his head. You have no right to ask anything of me right now. Goodbye, Rose. Devin, wait. But he walks out the door without a backward glance. <clears throat> the next morning at the palace. You mull over your options as Aveline finishes doing your hair, very angrily doing your hair, though the anger isn't directed at you. I can't believe the Lord Zessel. I knew he was always hated Ishma, but I never thought he'd stoop this law. Forget Cecil. I'm almost more worried about Rose. Perhaps you should send her another text. You pull out your phone and begin to type a little afraid of what you'll hear. How's it going? Oh, Daisy, not good. I think it'd be best if we met up. Preferably with tissues. That bad? My cover's not 100% blown yet, but things are very bad. Let's chat in person. Conservatory tonight? I'll be there. I don't know what I'd do without you, Daisy. Man, it's a good thing you got me. We'll figure this out somehow. I hope you're right. Everything okay? For now, we're meeting tonight to talk more. Good. And don't forget, you're meeting Prince Clark this afternoon to plan tomorrow's farewell ball. I know. I won't be going to the meeting. Why have I not? I know Cecil expects me to ruin the ball, but I can't do that to Clark's face. The easiest way to ruin it is just not to plan it with him. Then you'd better make yourself scarce. I'm sure Clark will come looking for you, and this will be the first place he tries. You head through the halls looking for a place in the palace where you won't run into a certain prince. If I were a secret room in a castle, where would I be? You turn the corner, nearly running into a figure, walking your way. Hey, Rose, I've been looking for you. Clark, uh, I... Why, where are you headed in such a hurry? A heading? I thought I'd see if the kitchens have anything worth raiding. Ah, I'm afraid I picked them clean already. I, uh, sh I'm shocked the kitchen staff haven't sent me a cease and desist. Honestly, that, that shouldn't surprise me. Is it safe to assume you've forgotten about our meeting, then? I guess I have. Then come along. This ball isn't going to play on itself, and we have a lot of, to cover. Clark leads you into a study where you plan your first ball together. He lays a few pages of notes out on the table as you sit down beside him. It feels like a lifetime since we planned his welcome ball. So, I've already been thinking about the decorations. I think we uh, shouldn't display any Ishmari flags, especially considering how Ishmar-centered uh, last night's uh, ball was. 
It will send a better message if we try to portray our kingdoms as equals. Small Ishmari touches with accent. Um, your Monterian ballroom. That's actually a really good idea. But since when has Clark cared about symbolism or decoration or our countries getting along? I thought you'd approve. So if we're in agreement, he holds out a ruffly sketched menu to you. Besides a list of known allergies and food preferences in the court, I was thinking we could serve fillets of cod for the main course as a nod to Monterey's southern fisheries. Uh-oh. It says on the other list that my dad hates fish. But letting this happen could be a pretty harmless way to ruin the ball the way Cecil expects me to. Clark, we have to pick something else. My father hates fish. A wise call. It's a good thing I've got you here with me. Yeah, good thing. That would have been a very weak way to ruin the ball anyway. Next up is the music. Again, last, uh, since things were uh, rather Ishmari last night, I thought I'd let Monterey's princess choose music. Meaning me, right. You look over a list of musicians ranging from popular string quartet to avant-garde group. One of those would put Lord Gregor in a fit keep Cecil satisfied, but Clark's so eager to do this right. Let's go with something classic. If there's one thing that uh, monetarians like, it's their strings. Understood. I'll send for the Royal String Quartet. This ball's too important to ruin. There has to be another way out. But before Clark can continue, the door to the study suddenly opens. How goes the planning, your highnesses? What are you doing here? Simply checking in on this historic ball. I want to make sure Prince Clark's send-off is adequate for the importance of the event. I assure you, Lord Cecil. We have everything under control. Cecil frowns as he leans over the table to peer at Clark's notes. Yes, I see it's going well. Shockingly well. He pointedly glares at you. Princess, let me remind you how important this ball is. Perhaps the most important ball you've ever planned. Think of what's at stake. We're well, well, I don't know, we're well aware, Lord Cecil. Frankly, you aren't. As you can see, we're very busy. So if you're done interrupting... Actually, I just wanted to let you know that I've already sorted out a performance. The what? The main entertainment for the evening. I booked a singer who has come highly recommended. Should be singing the Ishmari National Anthem. Clark winces and Sally shakes his head beside you. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Our National Anthem is very, uh, strident. I'm not sure your court would appreciate it. Nonsense. We're all about unification now, are we not? It would certainly send a message to Montarians. He's trying to make sure that Rose's court hates this ball. No matter what else I do. Cecil. Why don't we play Monterey's anthem instead? Oh, but the singer has already begun rehearsing Ishmael's anthem. It is far too late to change plans now. We just have to carry on with what uh, has already been agreed upon. He gives you a warning look, his hand strained towards the pocket in his vest. The photo, or pocket where the, he has the photos. Fine, as your lordship wishes. I see you both tomorrow, your highnesses. Says so Elise, and you instinctively sigh in relief. That man has the most punchable face I've ever seen. Mm, Rose, what's wrong? You don't want to know. You really don't want to know. What do you mean? I can tell something with you is off. You haven't been yourself today. I mean, I'm voluntarily doing extra legwork for this party and you haven't gotten in one good-natured jib about it. I'm... Fine. Everything's fine. Clark gives you a searching look, but he nods. If you say so. But we'll both need to be at our best for the ball. There's a lot riding on it, and, well, a great deal for me to think about before tomorrow. Decisions to be made. He gives you a sidelong glance, smiling, and you know he means a proposal. Your heart does a little flutter in your chest. The traitor. And how are you feeling about the decision? Truth be told, I've been thinking about it a lot, and what the future might look for us together. Does that mean he wants to propose? 
No, he wants to be together as friends. You know, you could never say yes. If Cecil gets his way, Clark will never even get a chance to ask, but you can't tell him any of that. I've been thinking about it, too. There's definitely a lot to consider. So why not let me take your mind off of it? If only for a little bit. I'm not sure if anything could. That's because uh, I never had a chance to take you riding on Isra. I promised you a ride at the Welcome Ball, and a prince keeps his promises. I'll take you anywhere in the capital you pick. I promise that well, once you're out of the palace, royal worries will be much easier to shrug off. I love that. Alright, I'd love that. Let's go. You try to push thoughts about Cecil and goodbyes out of your head and take a deep breath. But I'll only accept your invite on one condition. While we do this, we won't talk about the future. I just want to enjoy the present. Mm, very well. Lucky for you, I happen to be an expert in enjoying the present. Pun, maybe? Clark takes you to the stables, where Isra immediately perks up at the sight of you. She's grown fond of you. I'm glad I could befriend the most important member of the Ishmari delegation. Ouch, but I understand. At least I'm ahead of Aaron. Uh, bold of you to assume. Shaking his head with a smile, Clark leaps into the saddle on Isra's back and reaches down to pull you into the saddle behind him. Then you are ready to ride with the least important Ishmari delegate? Yes, but only because we're riding Isra. As soon as you're seated behind him, Clark spurs Isra out of the stables, galloping across the palace grounds. But as you approach the exit, you can see a dumbfounded guard standing beside the gate, the locked gate. Princess Rose, please stop! His Majesty doesn't want you to sneak off the palace grounds! Clark, look out! Not a problem. Clark urges Isra towards a hedge beside the gate. Hang on. Cling to his waist. You wrap your arms around his waist, feeling his muscles flex as you hold your body against his. Suddenly, Israel leaps and you're soaring above the hedges with an exhilarated rush of adrenaline. Israel lands and gallops away. Clark glances over his shoulder to grin at you. Having fun back there? You said to hang on. We should be in the clear now. We can ride out to wherever you'd like to go. Let's head into the countryside. I've got a place in mind. You direct Clark along a road towards the clock tower that Edmund told you about the day you learned he was your father. That's where my parents said their goodbyes, and it might be the last places I ever see with Clark. This place is beautiful. How do you know about it? It's... important to my father. He shared some important moments with my mother here. Well, then I'll be sure to honor the legacy of your family's favorite clock tower. You better, or else you'll hear from the ghosts of my ancestors. After arriving at the foot of the tower, Clark safely secures Isra outside, and you venture inside, climbing an old staircase, until you reach the top and step into a cozy room, the daylight basking the room in a soft glow as it shines through the clock face. That's pretty. That view is breathtaking. Monterey always knows how to impress. It certainly does. You turn to smile at Clark, only to find him looking at you, and for a moment you hold each other's gaze, then you look down at the city below and see children skipping through the square, dozens of figures going about their days. Look at everyone living their lives. They seem so carefree. None of them are worried about crowns, courtships, or international politics. One of the children stumbles headlong into a table, knocking the patron's food into the ground. Everyone has their hardships. True, but not all hardships are the same. Watching all those people below, it's hard not to imagine a different sort of life, one where things had never gotten this complicated. Clark, what do you think things would be like if we'd met under different circumstances? I thought we promised not to talk about the future. I didn't say anything about the imaginary futures, and this is more like a hypothetical past. 
Clark gently takes one of your hands, his touch sending a brief thrill up your spine. Even if the circumstances were different, I still think we would have uh, hit things off. I doubt there's a version of you who could resist my roguish charm, whether you are a princess or not. That's awfully confident of you. But you haven't said I'm wrong. I'm just saying, things would be much easier if we didn't have our titles or homes to go back to. I can't argue with the simplicity. Though, I wonder what we would be instead of royals in the hypothetical scenario. What if we'd met as... Mm, students. We could sit next to each other and pass notes or bump at each other on the quad while scrambling to get to class. And the only pressure in our lives would be finding time to meet up between classes. I like the sound of that. We could sneak out of the dorms together. Mm, or in each other's dorms. He gives you a wink that softens when he sees the smile on your face. And you could get to know the real me. You know, I used to dream about not being royalty. I know royalty comes with much privilege, but I didn't care for any of that when I was younger. All I saw was how cordly traditions got in the way of change. I used to imagine what I could really do if I wasn't a prince. Quite a lot, I imagine. Hey, I hate to tell you this, but even uh, a low, humble servant like myself... Um, yeah, no, change doesn't exist here either, okay? He smiles and turns to you. So, in our hypothetical world, where we aren't the leaguered royals, where would you want to go right now, if I offered to take you anywhere? I'd ask you to take me to a tiny, peaceful town to settle down. Hmm. I didn't think you'd be one for the quiet life. It's more about who I'd like to enjoy the quiet life with. Pretty much. You smile on him, man. For a moment, Clark seems at a loss for words. A peaceful little village sounds nice. We can manage to stay out of trouble there. I'm sure we could. Most of the time. Clark leans closer to you with the sunset gleaming along his jawline as he smiles, teasing and inviting all at once. And when we're alone together in this fantasy life, just the two of us, what happens then? I'd kiss you whenever I wanted to. Well, don't keep me waiting. Cupping his cheek in your hand, you gently pull him closer, reveling in the feeling as your mouth meets his. You let the kiss linger, lost in the moment, until you finally have to part for breath. It'd be just like that, hypothetically speaking. Mm, right, hypothetically speaking. He leans in, his breath warm on your lips, inches from kissing you again, and the clock chimes overhead. Unfortunately, back in reality, the big clock is telling me that time's up. We should probably get back to the palace. I guess we can't escape reality forever. You share a quick ride back to the palace stables. Once Ezra is safely in her stall, Clark turns to you. Listen, with all the preparations for the farewell ball, I may not see you again until tomorrow, so I hope you'll forgive me if I uh, break our no future talk rule. But for you, I guess I can make an exception. I know I'm supposed to return to Ishmar once the season ends, but I've grown awfully fond of Monterey. Both its people and its beauty. He takes both of your hands in his smiling. This sounds... This might sound crazy coming from me, but I'm feeling hopeful about the future. Maybe even, even a future here. He's not thinking of proposing, is he? Excitement and sadness churns inside you at the thought. Even if he stays, you can. But would it really hurt if you both got to imagine with the future for one more day? Clark, I'm feeling hopeful too. It means a lot to hear you say that. I just wish it could last. Yep, and I'll see you tomorrow, Princess Rose. I hope to make it a ball we'll never forget. He lifts your hand to his lips and kisses it, then departs, leaving you alone with your thoughts. Oh, Clark, you have no idea what's really in store tomorrow, thanks to Cecil. Or that I'll be having to say goodbye to you for good. Oh, will you, though? Later that night, as promised, you sneak out to the conservatory to find your sister. Rose takes one look at you and pulls you into a hug. Thank goodness you made it. Things got have gotten so awful. She sighs as you sit down beside the fountain together. Don't tell me the Delta's got shut down. Oh no, we won the Greek off. That's the one spot of good news. Well, complicated news since Faye also asked me to take over as leader. Me meaning you, but... 
I get it. I'll be leaving when the semester ends, so if you want to carry the torch until then, be my guest. Only if we make it through another day without the truth getting out. Devin figured it out after he saw you, who I am, who you really are. And his article on the Deltas and, well, you is coming out tomorrow. Speaking of lone covers, you feel very an uncessal threat in what he made you do to the farewell ball and what he's asked you to do to Clark. The scumbag. How did he even get those photos? Maybe he sent someone to follow me when I saw my mom, and they lurked around campus until they spotted you and Devin. That's awful. Irredeemable scumbag. I did everything he asked, so hopefully he'll hold up his end of the bargain. Uh, technically we didn't. We didn't sabotage the ball at all, except for the anthem. But to be honest, as far as I felt uh, about him ruining your reputation, I felt worse about the idea of Clark seeing those photos. If this ball wasn't about to be a huge disaster, I think he might be considering, you know... The swap has put us both in more risk than I ever expected. I'm sorry for getting you into it. It's okay. I don't regret a thing. Even if Devin tells the truth about us or Cecil decides to share those photos, I'd do this all over again if I could. These have been the best few weeks of my life. Funny, they've been the best of mine as well. But I guess step one of getting out of this is going along with Cecil's plan, Le leaning into tomorrow's train wreck of a ball and ending things with Clark. I know I would never have been able to say yes if he asked, because then you wouldn't have had to say yes, but perhaps this will be a kinder than letting him ask and having to refuse. You know she's right, but that doesn't make it any easier. You put your head in your hand, sighing. It feels like well, I'll be losing him twice tomorrow. Once when I say that things can't go for any further, and again when I leave for good. Strangely enough, I know how you feel. Devin hasn't answered any of my texts since yesterday, and they were extremely apologetic. Left on red. Ouch. Yep, welcome to Ghost. You pat her shoulder, and both of you sigh at the same time. Well, there's no point in dwelling on things we can't fix. You'll just have to get through tomorrow's ball, and I'll try to contact Evan again. Do you have some kind of royal PR staff who could do damage control if Devin prints the truth? Yes, but that's a problem for tomorrow. So why don't we go out for one last night of sisters? Commiserate after everything we've been through? I've always wanted to try that thing in American TV shows where someone gets a pint of ice cream and drowns those sorrows in it. I actually know an ice cream place that's open late. Faye and I used to go there after big exams. Well, then will you join me? One last hurrah before whatever tomorrow holds? Of course I will, sis. I just have one question. What is up with Pixelberry's obsession with ice cream? Seriously, every time you go to an ice cream place, think about it, all the books and all the chapters we've covered. Like, ice cream is supposedly supposed to, like, resolve all of your issues or make you feel better. It doesn't. Coffee is your friend. As you step into the ice cream parlor, rose and toe, you find it mercifully empty. I suppose 10 o'clock isn't the most popular time for ice cream connoisseurs. Are you kidding? That just means there's no one to ask who we are and why we look so much alike. We can assess our delicious options in peace. You can assess them. I'll be getting uh, my tried and true favorite, cookies and cream. It's okay. Okay, Miss Basic, I'll be the adventurous one for once. You eye the menu and order a colorful mix of ice cream and a cone. Hmm, interesting. Look at how much more fun this is. It's even shaped like a flower. I can't believe you're making fun of your own sister for liking an objectively superior flavor. It's a sibling privilege. Rose orders her cookies and cream, and you both settle in at a table with your treats. And I've been stressed out of my mind. Tell me about it. I can't believe everything fell apart so fast. I'm sorry I didn't see Devin before he saw me. There was nothing you could have done, just like there was nothing I could do about Cecil's dirty little spy snapping pictures of Devin and me. It's not fair that Cecil gets to use my relationship with Devin to blackmail you, when Devin and I are probably done for good. Rose. 
We'll fight this however we can. I don't know how yet, but Cecil's gotta have some weak spot in his plan, right? Yeah, I already told you what the weak spot is. You just go to your father, both of you. I hope so. Or at the very least, I hope he keeps up his end of the bargain. I suppose it's something that we didn't crash and burn until now. See? There are several linings like this ice cream. She scoops another spoonful from her cup, and that's when you notice shaved almonds on the top of her ice cream. Hey, I love shaved almonds too. They're also my favorite, father's favorite. It must run in the family. Out of all the silver linings from the swamp, I never thought I'd be a find a sister. It took me by surprise, too. But luckily for you, I can't say I mind. She gives you an unnecessarily regal wink, and after a beat, you both burst into giggles. You know, I really like having a sister. With me as your sister, I don't blame you. You think we'd have some sibling drama, or like fighting over who gets a television, but we get along, really. We're already up to our necks in drama. We don't need any more. Speaking of silver linings, I've been dying to know, what have you enjoyed the most about living my life? Who says your life is enjoyable? I'm a literal princess. Answer the question. You take another bite of your ice cream, letting it melt in your mouth as you consider your answer. So my favorite part has been... She hasn't made a difference. Think about it. She hasn't made a difference at all. She is literally focused about Clark and Ishmar, which is about Clark as well. She's literally made no difference whatsoever. Um, she got to know Clark, and got to actually help Clark in a way. Um, and she really didn't get to know her sister. I mean, think about these options. I mean, she got to know what her sister goes through, kind of, but... Uh, my favorite part has been getting to know you. Really? You'd pick me over fluffy pillows and your snarky Prince Clark? Of course. Nothing else compares to finding out that I have an awesome secret sister. Oh, Daisy, my heart is melting just like this ice cream. How about you? What's your favorite part about being me? Well, I left the palace to experience something new and exciting, and I got to experience some wild parties. I don't know how you spent your first semester at Julie Bart shut in your room instead of going out every night. Because some of us have academic priorities. That's your favorite part? The parties? What about me? You melodramatically clutch your heart looking wounded. I just said you were my favorite part and this is how you repay me? I can tell the truth. And the truth is that I liked partying up until the sun came up. This is one of the greatest betrayals of all time. Should I answer, Clark? We really were having a good time in each other's shoes. It's a shame that things got so complicated, especially with Devin and Clark. You can't hide your smile. Clark's so carefree and refreshing compared to the nobles in your court, and a sense of humor keeps things fun, even if I need to deflate his ego every now and then. I don't know how you do it. This might sound weird, but it makes me feel like his equal, even though I'm just pretending to be a real princess. Even when I'm with him, I feel like one. He sounds uh, just like the kind of person you needed to meet. Was Devin that person for you? Rose smiles ruefully. I suppose so. He just has this way of making everyone feel welcome, no matter how long you've known him. And no matter where you go, he sees the beauty in everything, in every person. When I was with him, I really felt like myself. No crown or expectations, just me, Rose. I just wish I could have shown him who I really am. In a moment of silence, Rose swirls her spoon in her ice cream. I didn't think I'd get so attached to Devon or the Deltas. I don't want to say goodbye. Neither do I. But even knowing that it has to end tomorrow, I do it all over again. From Devon and the Deltas to you, it's all been worth it. You reach over and embrace your sister, and for a moment everything feels like it's going to be okay. And no matter what happens tomorrow, we'll always have each other. Sisters for life. You caught up over ice cream. After saying your goodbyes to Rose, you make it back to her palace chambers. You're sure no one saw me going in or out?
Ugly. I kept watch myself. Says on your sconies won't have any new leverage on the rose. Thanks, Evelyn, for everything. She has out to her own quarters and you collapse on a rose's plush bed, sighing with relief when your phone buzzes. If that's Cecil, I'm gonna throw my phone in the deepest lake in this whole Wait, Dad. You open a nearby empty text thread from King Edmund. Good evening, Rose. I nearly sent the servants with a note, uh, but I'm trying to improve my knowledge of modern communication. I received word earlier today that a small sorority generated a great deal of donations for Julia Bar University in the annual Greek off. Oh, I didn't know you followed stuff on campus like that. That's sweet. Indeed! Since the house school bears our family's name, I wanted to acknowledge these girls' achievements and thank them personally. That's why I've invited the Delta Theta Delta sorority to the farewell ball, where I'd like you to give them an award. <laughs> Get wrecked. But if I'm at a ball as Rose and she'd be invited to it as me, oh no. Oh yes. Well, that complicates things. Not really. You're both expected at the farewell ball. It doesn't complicate shit. Literally and figuratively, it doesn't complicate shit. So let's get into it. First and foremost, please remember to like, share, and subscribe. Head down to the description below. Links to social media, Discord, and a few links to support me and my content. Without further ado, love your beautiful faces. Remember to support the channel any and all way you can. Without further ado, let's say the following. So, uh, again, I've, I've had this conversation several times with you. Hopefully you've been paying attention to the end of the videos here and there. Um, as I've said before, and I'll say it again, probably for hopefully the last time. All you have to do is literally and figuratively go, hey! Guess what, Dad? Guess who I found? My long-lost sister that you had, apparently, with the love of your life at one point, that um, basically she, uh, you know, didn't know who you were, and, you know, she moved away. You two split. Clearly, he knows this and acknowledges it. And, uh, yeah, no, she came back. Isn't that a great coincidence? Quick DNA test. All right, cool. Well, looks like we have a long-lost princess to the throne, and this, all it does is screw over Cecil, um, makes Clark and Devin happy, and yay! We're done with this book. We're literally done with this book. Unless they're going to keep this going, but most people hate this book, so let's be honest. Without further ado, love you beautiful faces, thanks for watching. Sorry it took a little late than uh, usual. I promised to get up chapter 17 ASAP, but uh, catch you all later. Peace out.